I want to speak everywhere, all the time, always. I want to get my message out to the world of complete freedom, mind, body, and spirit, and the physical reality that needs to accompany that to make that happen. And I'm going to use my lot as a stage to show, to do what you're doing here and to show people what off-grid looks like. That it's not a cabin in the woods, but it's pure luxury and beauty and health and love on every level. Unlearn what it means to create a food forest, to create a garden, that it doesn't have to be all this work, that it can be low maintenance. Mother Nature has already done her thing. We haven't fucked it up yet. <laughs> so we get to go in yeah. and partner with the land and let really this true abundance emerge. But focusing on the problem kind of sucks if you don't also have an avenue to solve the problem. Is literally the most logical, loving step for humanity. And why isn't it already here? Well, that's the great deception. Well, then we know what the idea is. It's to take back our power over our minds. The one thing that's been critically important is the more time I spend meditating and allowing my mind to relax and receiving these inspired ideas, it's a direct correlation with how fast this movement is happening. Allow your mind to silence, be in nature, be at peace, and follow your bliss. There's this idea that you need to go to a mountaintop and, and meditate for six weeks. And that's not, people, people can't do that. You just lost almost everybody. You did. Yeah. Right. And, and, and there's a way to integrate that spiritual path into the life that we want to live. Exactly. Like you said, I don't want to live off the grid in that sense of the word. I want right. to live off the grid where I'm sovereign. Yes. And so I want to hear what, like, what have you kind of been playing around with for ideas around that? Well, I'll go to what we're doing now and then I'll get into the history of the why and stuff. So right now we're building a community called Galt's Landing after John Galt from Atlas Shrugged, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. One of my favorite characters in any book ever, right? He's just uh, the, the epitome of self-reliance and sovereignty and um, providing value and creating, manifesting massively, right? So um, my buddy and I, Brian who Hickok, who taught me a lot about what's going on in the world right now, um, I couldn't see past a certain level. I knew that 9-11 was an inside job. I knew that all these things were happening, but I couldn't see past this level that I didn't understand, right? And, and then he said, there are people that really, they want death. They want the destruction of life. And I, it took me a while to get that. But then once I got that, it all clicked in. It all clicked into to place and I started seeing, wow. So anyway, we created this community. It's on 52 acres in central Florida. And um, it's got a runway on the East Coast. Um, we don't uh, own the runway, um, but we do plan on owning that runway someday, potentially. Um, but it's on a private 430 acre lake. There are 10 home sites on 52 acres. Every home site will have its own well, its own complete redundant power source, and its own fully designed food forest. So on the 52 acres, every lot will have enough food for the family to thrive. On top of that, the common area basically will also have, well, thousands and thousands of edible plants, medicinals, which of course, anything growing without poisons, any food growing without poisons, like Hippocrates said, let thy food be thy medicine, mm. is medicinal. So um, we're gonna create, a. it's a luxury, Development, small development. So that, when you say luxury, what's what's the price range? Price range, the lots are 500,000 okay, for the a, lot. And how big did you say the lots were going to be? A minimum of, of one acre. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. And and everything is going to be no grid at all. So food, water, and energy, complete self-reliance, all on site. Dude. Yeah, so what's the timeline awesome. look on this? Where are you in the this phase? We just got, basically the development just got started. The first house will be done in about three months. We've got, I own lot eight, and I'm going to use my lot as a stage to show, to do what you're doing here and to show people what off-grid looks like. That it's not a cabin in the woods, but it's pure luxury and beauty and health and love on every level. Oh man, was there a reason you picked lot eight? Was there a significance to the number or? So I picked lot nine originally. Um, I helped put the whole deal together and my partner Brian is the one that, uh, that funded it. He wanted, we decided to have a few 
a couple fewer lots, right? So he picked lot nine and 10. So I just moved over to lot eight and there was, it, it's directly facing the lake. I grew up on a lake. I'm very, I love the water. I love the energy of that. So every lot there is just amazing. Great. Yeah. And so let's get back, let's get into your backstory. Cause okay. you grew up in Minnesota. Yep. You spent 12 years in Costa Rica. Yep. And there was a lot that happened along the way. You had a successful exit of a company that you were part of, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So walk us through that because I think it's very important to, to give people, uh, the, I haven't even introduced you yet, which will, <laughs> which will come. Jim Gale here for Food Forest Abundance. Yep. You're speaking tonight here in Austin uh, at Texas Nexus, which is a blockbuster lineup. Yeah. Mickey Willis, Dr. Judy Mikovits, Del Big Tree, Dr. David Martin, I think JP Sears, and there are a few other people that I'm not as familiar with, but um, holy shit, dude. Yeah. I mean, were you? what was it like when they're like, hey, Jim, would you like to speak at this? So when Carissa first mentioned it, I didn't know of it. I had no idea that this was going on. And I said, I want to speak everywhere, all the time, always. I want to get my message out to the world of complete freedom, mind, body, and spirit, and the physical reality that needs to accompany that to make that happen. And so when I found out how substantial this was, oh my gosh, I am so freaking inspired. It's nuts. Yes. <laughs> it, and, you know, uh, Carissa had reached out to me and, and asked, so our mutual friend, Carissa, she's like, hey, I, I don't know how you choose your guests for the podcast and so on and so forth. I said, honestly, I generally don't podcast with anybody I don't know. I like to have a rapport with them. And, you know, there's enough people that I know that I can, you know, kind of fill the roster. And uh, she's like, oh, totally understand. But just send me, send, she's like, he was on Dell's show, which was like, okay, that's a big deal. I fucking love Dell. He's a dear yeah. brother. It's like, okay, so there's something there. Send me, send me the clip. I'm two minutes into the clip. I'm like, this fucking guy is coming <laughs> on my podcast. Like I totally connected right away. And then sealed the deal. Maybe it was like seven or eight minutes in. You started to tear up. Oh, I think you were gosh. talking about your daughters and I'm like, oh, this is my guy. This is my guy. Right. So right. I'm so excited to have you here today and to, to share. This is kind of my active service to my listeners to bring someone like you on to change the land, to unlearn what it means to create a food forest, to create a garden, that it doesn't have to be all this work, that it can be low maintenance. And, and just what I learned from speaking with you and from the, the 30 minute clip on Dell's show, um, The High Wire really opened my lens and got me super excited to create a food forest here at our property in Austin and then at the property that we just visited out in Spicewood. So I'm excited to dig into that today oh, as well. I'm so excited too. That foundation, the, the beauty that you already have there, the life that you already have there is a great foundation. A lot of times we work with properties where there is no life because it's been a poisoned lawn for generations or at least a couple of decades. Yeah. And so we have to build the life. So what you have is such an incredible foundation. Mm, thank you. And you know, it, it, it calls to mind uh, a friend of mine who's been on the show a couple of times, Boyd Vardy. He grew up in a game reserve in South Africa. And when his, his dad and uncle took over the game reserve, they brought somebody in to help them because it was in a complete disarray. And what the, the, the gentleman who came in, the mentor said was you need to partner with the land. And, and what you're saying right now is the, the mother nature has already done her thing. We haven't fucked it up yet. <laughs> so we get to go in yeah. and partner with the land and let it like really this true abundance yes. uh, emerge. So I'm yeah. excited for that. Yeah. We design it in, we design what God has given us all of the seeds, all of the tools to literally create the Garden of Eden is literally the most logical, loving step for humanity. And why isn't it already here? Well, that's the great deception. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get into your backstory, brother. Right. So I grew up in Minnesota. I was, I had a frog in my pocket all summer long. <laughs> <laughs> like wasn't very popular with the ladies, right? <laughs> I, was, I had glasses that had tape here and here. <laughs> Literally, I had a thing in the back to hold them on my head and I'd still lose them every other day, right? I was just that guy. I was in the swamp, in the mud, playing sports. I got into wrestling when I was about nine years old. And that became my thing, right? That became who I was. And thank God for wrestling or, and, and for a lot of people, any sport or any passion, because that 
really helped me define myself. I started, in fact, I'll never forget when my wrestling coach, when I was really, really young, just in it, he said, Jim, I think you have talent, but you don't listen. I was like 10 years old. And I remember that day, Tony Nelson. I remember that day when he told me that because somehow he, he, he got through and I started listening for the first time. And then it progressed and I ended up, um, thanks to a lot of great coaches, great mentors, being a, a four-time All-American national champ in college. No shit. Yeah, yeah. Damn. Yeah. Um, in fact, this is so important is, is creating a compelling vision of the future. I had no vision until I was 19. My college coach, wrestling coach came in and gave everybody a, a couple pieces of paper with it said goals on them. And I was like, oh, God damn it. I hate paper. I hate the pen. I just want to party and chase gals and wrestle. I don't want to write anything down. He said, you have to have this on my desk on uh, Monday at practice, right? So it's Friday night. I put it on my desk. Um, I, I avoided it. I procrastinated until Sunday night. Because it was for wrestling, I started writing my goals. And that changed my life because for the first time ever, I started visualizing myself in the future in a way that inspired me. And the person that came into the wrestling room Monday was a different person than the person that left on Friday. And from there, I was in, uh, nominated captain of the wrestling team as a freshman in college. What? Which it was a very young team. They Dude. were seventh in the conference. Like it, it was just, I was just the guy that was the most inspiring in the room, I guess. But that Doug James reached up and said, I would nominate Jim Gale and somebody else second. And that was the mind blower for me. So then I had to live up to that, which I actually enjoyed that. I really said, okay, if that's who they think I'm going to be, I have to be that person. So we can create people along the way by helping them see the best part of themselves. And so, and then um, I just, I've got very passionate about it. When I, and this is another thing was people would say, you, Jim, you work so hard in the room. And I'd be like, really? I, I just, I just feel like I'm having fun. Like I'm just wrestling and it's what I want to do. Right? Yeah, I think that's such an important lesson that, that a lot of us miss is yeah. that. It's like when we're doing something that we truly enjoy, when we're in our, our genius, our gift, it's not work. We're, there's a lot of energy around it, but it's not work. We know when it's work. Fuck. Yeah. When you're grinding, you know, and there are times I'm sure when the practice was hard and you had to, you know, kind of grit your teeth and get through it. But, yeah. but largely it's, it's, Think about those times in your life when you had that sense of timelessness and you were just doing whatever you needed to do. And people would make comments. They're in awe. Wow. How can you just go? And I know, you know, sometimes around the house here, my wife will just be blown away by like, I don't know how you have so much energy. I'm like, I, this, I'm just having so much fun right now that I don't want to go to sleep and I can't wait to wake up and, you know, but we can go long periods of time yeah. when we forget that. Yep. And we get stuck in, 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 a, in a spot, maybe it's a career or a relationship that doesn't feed that. And we think that it's just the way it's got to be. But if we remember when we were younger Absolutely. to the time when we were on the wrestling team. Yeah. And, and so I'm, I'm curious, um, and I do want to get to the part um, where you had, because having that financial freedom can be a blessing and a curse mm -hmm. for a lot of us. And so I would love to hear you talk about um, I believe, was it a mortgage company that you yeah. were involved with? Yeah. So tell yep. us a little bit about that. So after college, I moved to Hawaii, bartended and partied my ass off for four years. And then I was looking to do something different. And I've got a backpack. I moved to Surfer's Paradise, Australia by myself. Lived there for four months. I went to Bond University every day, almost, if I wasn't too hungover. Like I was partying. It was just because I was in that transitional period from bartender guy and bar guy to what am I going to do next? So there's that weird transition. And I listened to Jim Rohn and Dennis Waitley and Zig Ziglar and all of the greats every single day. I read all the books that I could get my hands on, on human performance. And that is when I decided and wrote my goals for the second time, basically 10 years later. Oof. I wrote that I wanted to have $3 million in three years. Now I was a bartender <laughs> with a teaching degree, right? Shit. And I had no other experience besides that. But I believed what Napoleon Hill and all these greats were telling me. So I wrote my goals and I got home and meet this guy, Jason at the bar who knew me from wrestling. And he said, Jim, why don't you come work for my mortgage company? Right. It's not a pay. It's not no salary or nothing, 
But he said, your mom's a realtor. I think you could do well. And I was happy to get the invite, right? I worked there for a few months. I worked at another place for a few months, worked at another place for a few months. I said, I'm starting my own company. And so I was 11 months in and started a mortgage company. Come on. Yeah. Crazy, right? Dude. And, and then as soon as I get into something, I am so, I daydreamed my way through school. I cannot, I, I cherish my ADD. It is. I want people to, to listen to this for all, all of us who are parents out there. Like don't misdiagnose your kid's boredom with school for them having real issues. They're just fucking bored at school. They're not learning what they want to learn, but yeah. when they are into something like you're about to share with us, yeah. like, holy shit, it's a whole different energy. It's a whole different energy. The excitement going on in my head was way more exciting than that blah, blah, blah up in the front of the room. Yeah. And God bless those teachers for what they do, but I could not pay attention. So I learned this stuff and I was first blown away that I never learned it before. So I started writing my goals, got back, got the mortgage company going. And within three and a half years, we did about a billion three in closed <laughs> loans. <laughs> yep. Exploded. We changed the industry in Minnesota because it was very, I don't know, monolithic. It was very um, structured and organized. And the owners of the companies made all the money and the loan officers made a little bit of the money. Well, we changed it. We wanted to decentralize. We wanted to grow. And so our mission became to serve loan officers. No shit. Which is so reminiscent of exactly what we're doing now with the food forest movement. Uh. We're taking that same idea and we are, our goal is to serve the cooperatives who are out there helping people grow food. So I'll come back to that a little bit. Um, wrote the goals. Uh, after I was in the mortgage business for basically three and a half years, I got bored with it. It wasn't inspiring any longer. And you mentioned having the money. I thought that that would be the end all be all, right? Yep. And I was like, this, I'm not happy. I wanted a relationship. I wanted kids. I was 33 years old. And it was kind of that down part right? And it ebbs and flows. So I bought a boat. I went and lived on the ocean for a year. And then mm -hmm. I found Costa Rica. And that's when I, 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 I've always loved the jungle and the nature and all this. So I moved to Costa Rica and that's when I learned about the unsustainable nature of our society. Uh. Yeah. And I, my first reaction to that, and I had just had my first two girls was What's the world going to be like in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? What's the world of our grandkids going to be like? And I went through two years of hell, kind of, because I went down that rabbit hole, every direction. I watched every Richard Gabe, every, any video out there, zeitgeist and loose change. And no matter what it was, I was in, I was just obsessed with learning what the problem was, but focusing on the problem kind of sucks if you don't also have an avenue to solve the problem. Right. And I'm an optimist. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell that. And it's, I think it's, it's, it's certainly what's happening today in this world that uh, we become so focused on the problem and we don't see any solution. And some people aren't seeking a solution. They're just caught in the drama of the problem. And it's a lot to hold. Like, how can it be as bad as it is? How did I not see this coming? And, and when you're waking up to it for the first time, it's, it's, it's a lot to hold. Yeah. Right. And, you know, which is why the tonight's event, Texas Nexus is about sovereignty. It's about personal freedom. Like, how do we, what are the solutions for what we're all experiencing or witnessing right now? And so I love that you're going to be a part of that oh, panel I'm tonight. So excited to share what I have been obsessed about. I mean, we know that there are poison producers and poison manufacturers and governmentes that mandate the use of poisons in our world. And that is, if we can call them an enemy. Now, I'm also a big believer in the law of attraction and that there has to be contrast for humanity, the yin and the yang, the good and the bad, the dark and the light. I believe it's all part of a much bigger divine natural system and it's way out of balance. And I think it was Thomas Jefferson said, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time or nourished from, with the blood of patriots and tyrants for that is its natural manure. 
Mm. right? What a reference, right? Mm. And so this ebb and flow is always going throughout history, but it's so far out of balance that my question, my obsession was how do we solve the problem? In fact, I, Victor Hugo said, there's one thing more powerful than all of the armies of the world. And that is an idea whose time has come. Well, then what's the idea? That's been my question. And I believe I found it. Well, let's, let's hear the idea. Yeah, damn right. Let's tell the people what they want to <laughs> yeah, hear. Damn right. Well, it, it's in two parts. One is our vibration. You know, I think Tesla said, if you want to change the world in 10 years more than it's ever been changed, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration, something like that. And so I started going, okay, how do I increase my vibration? Right. And then I look at the poisons that we're consuming, the fluoride in the water, the glyphosate, the unnatural foods. These aren't even foods. They're just financial and marketing and tools of enslavement. Right. Um, Henry Kissinger, the, one of the deep state, you know, slave masters said, if you want to control nations, control oil. If you want to control people, control food, which also controls the medical system because with the poisonous food we eat, they got us in all these different directions. So the idea, the embarrassingly simple idea, in fact, one of my heroes, Bill Mollison, who is the founder of Permaculture, said that, there's, um, that though the problems of our world are increasingly complex, the solutions remain embarrassingly simple. So I'm thinking, okay, we've got this idea. What is the solution? And so I started packing all this together and looking at all the clues that life has given us. And the more I meditate, the more I raise my vibration, the more everything becomes a synchronicity, a clue. We just have to learn to look for them, right? So the idea whose time has come literally is the Garden of Eden idea. Now think about this. This seed has been divinely planted within all of our psychologies. Everybody not only knows of this idea, but they can describe it in glorious detail. It's true. Isn't that nuts? Yeah, because I'm not religious at all, but I, I, yeah. I know it well. You know well, right? Wow, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, it is. And yet, most people, when I say it's not only possible, but it's logical and relatively easy, they get all squirmy. Don't they? <laughs> yeah, dude. I, I, they, uh, yeah. Like, oh, what's going There's on? There's no way. What's, yeah, yeah, you're what's fucking the trick? with me here. Yes. Like, well, really, they say you're crazy. That's a utopic fantasy. That's just nuts. It's impossible, right? That is the root deception. That's the root deception. So then if that's the root deception, well, then we know what the idea is. It's to take back our power over our minds. Governmente is a word that it's not an accident that the slave masters call themselves the mind control. <laughs> How perfect is that? Dude. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's talk about practically how do we how, how do you kind of uh, unfold this to the people? Yeah, so we unfold it. So there are economic systems, right? There's for the common good economic systems of socialism and communism, right? They are rooted in violence. They are rooted in destruction. They are rooted in theft. The only economic system that I'm aware of that is rooted in the peaceful and voluntary exchange of value, in the inspired exchange of value, is capitalism. Mm -hmm. So we expose that truth to people and say that if we can raise our vibrations and we can show the world, we can demonstrate and inspire the world to grow food instead of lawns, we literally win this game on every level. And this is the re-love ocean. Thank you, Ron Paul. Right for that relovution. This is the revolution because all mm. the problems of the world can be solved with a garden. So practically speaking, you you, you just saw my property here. Yeah. Like we've got a, a fair amount of grass. Like what does it look like to to create a Garden of Eden here? So beautiful. So the same amount of energy expense and maintenance that you put in your lawn, if you use that same amount of energy and you plant a well-designed, thoughtfully designed food forest that mimics natural systems, mimics God's systems, then it's as much maintenance as that forest across the street. Who maintains the forest? Nobody. Nobody, right? That's the beauty of the Garden of Eden. That's the beauty of thoughtful design is finding a way to put these plants together 
that they will support each other, but in a way that is designed for humans to produce the maximum yield. Yeah. And it, so we have uh, some, we, we didn't get to see them yet, but some uh, kind of, what do you call the boxes, the steel boxes. Raised beds. Or there, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Raised beds. And we've planted stuff there uh, over the past few years, but it's been very much in their own section. Yeah. You've got the squash here, you've got the cucumbers here, the tomatoes there. But what you're doing is you're mixing them all together, correct? So yes, and I'm a huge fan of raised beds. Raised beds are a great tool in many different environments and circumstances. Um, what I'm even a bigger fan of, but it takes a little bit longer to come to fruition, is the perennial edible landscape. And so there's a big difference between annuals and perennials. Annuals, it might take five or 10 minutes every other day to produce a lot of food, right? But you have to get out there. You have to do a little bit of stuff with them. You, an annual is something you plant once, you harvest, and then you plant a new seed and you harvest. A perennial is something like a fruit tree or a berry bush that lasts oftentimes for generations. In fact, there's an olive tree in the Greek Isle of Crete that has been around producing olives for over 2000 years. Oh, damn. Yeah, that's wow. the magic of nature of God. And now, okay, so we, you know, we were about to plant some fruit trees outside. Fortunately, we didn't do it because we, everybody lost their trees during the yeah. snowstorm here. Yeah. But like what trees do well here in this climate, fruit so, trees? So every climate has zone specific. You want to mimic the natural situation of that zone. So we've got actually a group of 14 designers who have expertise in every zone. We can go from the driest places in Arizona. In fact, I want to shine a light on uh, Jeff Lawton right now because Jeff Lawton went to the deserts of Jordan where the ground was salt packed and it was one of the driest places in the world. And 10 years later, there's a food forest growing there. Yeah, they found mushrooms for the first time. There are people in their colleges who are the agricultural department. They'd never seen mushrooms in their country ever. And they thought there was a problem. Oh my gosh, we got this fungus. Well, it was a mushroom. No yeah. shit. Yes. And what was the yeah. process to to create that food forest. So the, the, it started in an area like that. It starts with catching and storing energy, in this case, water, right? Because it's so dry. So you store water in the ground. You dig swales, you dig ditches. Very simple production, by the way, relative to the value that it creates. And then you layer mulch and that mulch as it decays turns into soil. And then that soil can hold the water. And, and underground springs, you can actually create, um, when you have a series of swales over time in a dry area, you will all of a sudden have springs popping out of the ground with life everywhere. Damn. It's magical. And so, it's all there. So how did, how did the food thing come to you though? Like, I, I, like yeah. let, let's, get, let's drill into that a little bit because you, you left this highly successful business, which I, I love that after three and a half years, like I'm bored with this. It's, it's uncommon for someone at the height where they're making a lot of money, they have this great business to say, you know what, this just isn't fun anymore and I, and I need to walk away. Yeah. And so I commend you for following your heart there because a lot of us would be like, well, still make a lot of money. I left the trading business after 18 years. People couldn't understand why I left. Right. And I've often said it would take more courage for me to stay because it was yeah. so hard the last you know year, year and a half of being there. It just wasn't filling my cup anymore. So right, right. I just want to acknowledge you for, oh. for following that and kind of going a different direction. But you know, you were in Costa Rica, you started to understand what it was like back here in the States where our issues were. Yeah. You went down the rabbit hole. Yeah. So what was the, I mean, you obviously, it wasn't like an overnight thing where you came up with food forest abundance. Like right. what was the trajectory or what were the fits and starts you had with, with creating that? Yeah, that's such a great question. I love the uh, analogy. And, and I know this is a bunch of BS, Thomas Edison in the light bulb. I really think it was Tesla, but this analogy that it takes, you know, he tried a thousand times or 10,000 times to create the light bulb and he didn't fail. He just found all these ways not to do it. Right. Well, that is the experience I went through. And so it, it started with criticism. 
So I bought a big property and we were going to do a golf course. And my vision for the golf course was to turn this cattle pasture, which was a biological desert. It was just cows and, you know, bird once in a while, a couple of trees, but it was relatively speaking, it was dead. And my goal was to turn that into the most beautiful golf course where we had fruit trees lining every fairway. The first thing we did after buying the property was we created a fruit tree nursery. We started planting out the fairways and stuff. So then I got criticism by the local environmentalists who said they hated me because I was a developer in a pristine area. Um, now, Cattle Prester wasn't pristine at all. And where, where was this? In Southern Costa Rica. Okay. But the area is, if you just go another couple, you know, half a mile in, it's just pure jungle. Most biologically diverse place in the world or one of them. So I started getting criticism. And at first I'm like, what are these people hate me so much? So I invited them into my office. I said, could you share with me what you hate about what I'm doing so much? Because I think we're doing good work. And they proceeded to tell me about this term permaculture and how I was destroying the natural environment and so on. So I'm like, okay, well, uh, I, I actually, my goal was to get them to advocate for our development because I felt that good about what we we're doing. They basically said, no way in hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, they left. I wiped the blood off and the sweat and the tears. And one word stuck out. So I got online that night and I said, what is permaculture? And that was another rabbit hole. I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. How come we all don't know this? How come this isn't a class taught in every school in the world? Well, we know why now, yeah. <laughs> right? Wow, yeah. Because the control grit, yeah. because this is the loss of power. This, this science, this agricultural design science literally wipes out the slave masters. It is. It's, it's, uh, yeah, this is decentralization as it you is. were talking about. Yes. Yep. So uh, I went down that rabbit hole. My first thing was to build a community in the jungles of Costa Rica. In fact, it was 2008, nine, the golf course thing, the economy completely oh, yeah. went bye-bye yep. and it has continuously gotten worse in Costa Rica, unfortunately. Like it didn't have a rebound like we do here a little bit in 2012 because people were end of the world thing were coming down just like they kind of are a little bit now. So there's a couple small rebounds, but the government tyranny in Costa Rica is actually worse than it is here, believe it or not. That's hard to believe. It, it's, it's really sad. My friends there and stuff, it's very top-down control. So um, I, I got into, uh, as the economy collapsed, my next thing was, okay, what's the solution? What's something we can do to, to fit the needs of the market? So I had this property, 700 acres up in the mountains, four wheel drive access. And I said, I'm going to create a community here that the first thing we're going to do is plant thousands of fruit trees and create this amazing food production system. Well, that was the most successful thing I did there. We were actually two years running the most successful community in the country. We're growing like crazy, but what we attracted was a very diverse group of people. And this is why I love when people reach out to me who want to create intentional communities. Intentional communities around the world have failed over and over and over again. And it's always been the same reason. Because when you get people living and sharing resources, you have to make sure that the people are aligned and integrous. We had hardcore Democrats, hardcore Republicans, hardcore science, hardcore religious. And they, we had one community center. And they fought like crazy. And I was the guy who created the community. So I was the guy that got called when the dog ate another dog or when two 75-year-old men were fighting and one has a, a, you know, it was crazy. I understand the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I paved that road up to, up to my community. It was crazy. So I learned I could not be here now without learning from that very traumatic experience. And so what ended up happening with that community? So after I, so I can only sell something that I believe in. Yeah. And I was the one who sold 90% of everything there. And after I realized that most of the people, 50, 60, 70% of the people who bought in, they weren't happy that they bought in six months or a year or two years or three years later, I could no longer sell it. So I handed over the reins and I left. I said, I am sorry, folks, but I cannot sell this. And the community ever since then has been very stagnant. And there's some great people living there. Some of my best friends still live there. Um, 
And I guess now, just in the last three months, it's starting to come back and get this new energy again. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's one other community that I created that's actually rocking because I learned a lot from the first one. Still had similar issues in the second one, but there's the right people moved in there and they're proving the exact model that I had the vision of. They're actually living it. And it's, it's awesome. And so then you're taking these, these, these lessons learned yes. and creating the, the community in Florida. Yes. And it's uh, another thing I've learned is you don't want joint ownership of a thing like that because that's where people get very opinionated. You want to have titled ownership. You know, a loyal title would be great, although we haven't figured out how to quite What's do that. A loyal title is that title is. that is not bound by any government. No oh taxes, no nothing, like the church, you know, like things like that, where they are not bound. They're, they've got their own government, but they're not bound by any uh, political government like the U.S. government. So how do you kind of screen people or like, how, how do you create the community that you want when you're developing something like in Florida? Yeah. So we do, I actually have a personal policy where one of the first things I talk with people about is I say, I do not support force and violence. I do not support forced vaccines, forced medical, anything. I do not support forced masks. And that usually is the end of it. Yeah. (laughs) They're done. You're either in or you're out. You're either in or you're out. Yeah. And I'm very upfront about that. And it has been the most freeing thing I've ever done in business. Good for you. Because it's not easy, but that's back to being in integrity. Yeah. And speaking your truth yeah. and back to what we were talking about before we got on yeah. uh, this idea that the biggest shift that I think you and I both experienced is when we stopped caring what other people think. Yeah. And uh, it's a practice that you tell me, we, we were laughing, you kind of tell yourself you don't care when you still really care, but yeah. it's, it's part of that path of getting to the other side where you truly stop caring. And then you get to speak that truth. Mm-hmm without caring what anybody thinks. And you're not doing it to trigger anybody. You're just saying, look, this is who I am. You want to be part of this community? This is what we abide by. And um, if you're not into personal freedom, then this place isn't for you. Oh, it's so powerful when you can let go of that instant reaction of anger. You know, I used to get these emails from people in the community and my response would be angry. Now, if I get a similar experience, my response is, oh, really? You know, it's just, I let go of the anger part of it. You know? Yeah, because you don't need to be right anymore. I don't care. You know how you like, feel yeah. and yeah. You, you allow them to feel how they want to feel. And I think yeah. that's a huge part of, of not caring is when you start to understand that we have our own truth, whatever that is. And when we can honor that, then hopefully we can honor that for other people. Yeah. Even if they come with rage and anger yeah. and spit and vitriol and you can yeah. just... Hold space for that, but not engage in it. Yeah. Yeah. And and I mean, people like Dell and, and and Mickey and everybody who speaks the truth has got to go through this. Yeah. You know, Judy Mikovitz, right? I mean, how much did she get bashed for decades, right? So having that experience and then coming out the other side, well, it's it's so powerful. Mm, so let's talk a little bit more about I'd love to give for my listeners what it would look like to work with you and your team. So everything starts with design. Somebody is inspired to grow food instead of lawns. They get a hold of us and we and you're talk. And you're saying, and just, yeah. so just for everybody listening, you're not talking about this, like we have a pretty big property yeah. here. You don't need an acre and a half, yeah. right? Like what? what's the, the range, the smallest yeah. bit of grass that they have? What would you say would be? I love it. So we've got one design that's 400 square feet. Okay. Yeah. 400 square feet and we stack it. So we start with the roots and tubers and the herbaceous and the smaller shrubs and the bigger shrubs. And we mix it all together. We've got a fence in the back where we've got vine and grapes and passion flower. And the whole thing becomes a densely packed food forest. So most of our designs, in fact, our target market is the suburban backyard because there's over 40 million acres of lawn just in the United States. If we turn 30% of that 40 million acres of lawn into perennial edible landscapes that are less maintenance than the lawn, we'll wipe out 90% of the family's chance of having cancer and diabetes and heart disease and all of these tools of enslavement. When we do that, we literally reverse mass extinction. We reverse deforestation and we reverse global, you know, global hunger. We Mm. solve all of it. Mm, I love it. So let's, 
So someone wants to get in touch with you and say, hey, Jim, we've got quarter acre. We want to we want to do something here. What does that process look like? So they get a hold of us. And I usually talk to everybody, at least now I've talked to almost everybody. Uh, my phone number's right on the front of the, the website. Nice. I love this process. I love chatting with people about what their desire is, what their goals are. And then I like adding ideas, which they may not have thought about. And then what's even the most exciting is in the last 40 days, we've got over a hundred designs going in 10 countries in 30 plus states. And every one of those people also wants to become a demonstrator showing how easy and wonderful and beneficial. I mean, just the cash ROI, you take a cherry tree or peach tree, you're talking about a couple hundred percent return over a few years. Where else can you get a proven return like that in the market? No, it used to be crypto, but that's taking a shit lately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, crypto is such an interesting thing, but yeah. So the the return on every level of life is phenomenal. So anyway, we start by asking questions and then we start the design process. We ask for pictures and videos of the land, a survey, we do a Google earth and we find out what the customer wants. And then, like I said, we add the ideas and the possibilities. And then they're usually, by then they see how their food forest can be a benefit on every level. Yeah, damn. And I got excited when we were out at the property today and just, you know, I shared with you that my wife Peyton and I have been designing some stuff. There's that barn there that you saw that's getting a, a makeover. We wanted to have a garden. We're like, yeah, I mean, we have all this land. We should have a garden, but neither of us garden. And it felt like a lot of work. And then right. when, when uh, Carissa reached out to me and shared your video, I was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what we need. Yeah. And so to have you come see the land, um, I love, I'd love for you to share like what you saw, what you felt when you were there and the kind of the possibilities. Well, the first thing I noticed was the wildflowers of all the different colors, mm -hmm. right? I just love seeing that because that is the foundation, you know, you've heard about the decline of the bee population yeah. and the butterflies and the insects due to the poisons that are in all areas of our atmosphere, water, soil, and our minds. And so to see that was awesome. And then to hear your what you're planning on doing with that amazing property and having events and hosting people and creating joy. And when you stand in a thriving food forest, it raises your vibration. So we design it according to the desires of, of everybody's individual goals. So um, what I see walking out that, I see kind of a circular area where you've got different raised beds and then different a different kind of raised bed. So there's the raised beds that you were talking about. And then there's the mulch raised beds, right? Where you've got layers of soil and of nutrition for the plants. And then you plant the nitrogen fixers, the beneficial insect attractors, and then you load it up on layer upon layer of food producers. And then you design it in a way that's artistic, I guess is the best way to say it, where you can create view lines, where it's literally the same as landscaping, except for it's designed to be more functional. In fact, one of the terms in permaculture is stacking functions. So you take an element of a system and you give it multiple uses. Oh, I love it. And yeah. you plant again, like you're, you're, you're throwing down and just kind of using um, the example of what you did out at Dell's property, but planting several different varieties of seeds yeah. that all kind of work together in a way. That's exactly right. We're mimicking natural systems, right? That's permaculture is finding out what nature does because nature is our best teacher by far. And then mimicking that, um, you know, storing water, like on your place, your roof, we definitely want water catchment from the roof. We want, uh, in some cases, we'll want to do some swales. So when the water is going over the land, normally if water, is, it, it causes erosion. But if you put some swales in strategic locations, which are just ditches on contour, then you can stop that water flow you can slow it down and then the nutrients will go into the, into the land along with the water. Yeah. So you're capturing the energy. And, and then to, to, you know, I know we'd want to have someone come out and check the soil, the grade and all that, but how, how, how long does it take, you know, just judging on what you saw today yeah. to make sure that that soil is rich with nutrients? Like, and what's the process look like? So 
we build soil so we can take pretty much any land and really work on building soil. Um, so it takes years and years and years to create six, eight inches of soil, you know, maybe a decade in some places, if you provide the right foundation, we can speed things up though, by having soil delivered, by creating the swales so it doesn't get run off. And then by mulching. And in fact, this is a very important place. Anybody, by the way, can do this at home. If you want to create a little guild, you can go online and you can actually look up a guild for an apple tree or a pear tree or a what's peach a, tree. What's a guild? A guild is a community of plants that work well together. Gotcha. Yep. So you can look up these guilds and then here's the, the steps. You want to, if you have lawn, you want to probably sheet mulch. In most cases, you want to put down cardboard. You want to suppress the current pioneering plants or the lawn, which isn't a pioneer. That's just that the lawn is the only weed that we have. Mm -hmm. All these other plants, the weed is another psyop. It's another trick of the trade to get you to spray poisons. There's no such thing as weeds in nature. Everything has a benefit. Everything has a value. Some plants dig their tap roots down meters to find water and they also open up the soil. Some plants create big, huge webs and they, oh, this is freaking amazing. There are trees. They've studied trees now where they have the, they call it the mama tree, right? It will have an offspring and there's an underground web of communication going on. Another tree they put even closer to the mama tree, but it's not the offspring of the mama tree. The mama tree will give resources to its offspring and not give resources to that other tree in some cases. Dude. It's nuts. That's, <laughs> that just goes to show how little we know about how this whole thing works. You nailed it. You nailed it. Mm. There's one other fun, like this one I just learned um, from... Um, I'm going to, I'm going to remember this fellow's name, Nicholas Bertner, who was here in Texas. He is a phenomenal permaculturalist. And uh, he was talking about how wasps will be there. You see a wasp nest, right? Under your awning. And you've got a garden right there. Do not knock that wasp nest off. That wasp nest is going to be your best friend. Because when a plant is getting eaten by a, a grub, a worm, or some kind of insect, the plant will release pheromones. It will basically send out a distress signal. The wasp, we can't see this, but the wasp is flying over the garden and they see this pink hue over there, a vibration of pheromone. And they go, oh, they go down, they eat the larva, the beetle, the bug that's killing the plant. No shit. No shit. Dude. Yeah. Okay. Spiders, geckos, snakes, everything in balance is the Garden of Eden. Damn. And do we have to worry about deer? We talked about it a little bit when we were at the property, but like what, what are, are deer going to eat your, your, what kinds of fruit are they going to eat? Are they going to eat your lemons and limes or? So maybe not so much the lemons and limes. Deer, so normally in a balanced system, You've got wolves and bears. You've got an apex predator, one, let's say, like a big cat per 100 square miles. But in this area, we don't have a lot of those apex predators. Those were the first things killed off in most cases. So we have to be the apex predator. So if we don't want to kill and eat deer, then we have to use fences, you know? And I don't like fences, but fences can serve so many functions. Instead of just having a fence, an ugly fence, you can turn it into a trellis that it actually becomes your grapevines. Mm, I love that idea. Yeah. And what about like, we look outside here, would you, on that fence any there, is, is there anything you can do on that or? God, that fence is a great, I, I look at that fence and I salivate. Really? Like, that what is would you such do with that office? fence? We could just get a fence that kind of lines our property yeah. here. Imagine if that were pure green. Would that look beautiful? Amazing. It would we look want like coverage. Yes. And what would it do for the noise of the street? Oh yeah. Boom. It'd be a buffer. And so it would create beauty. It would create habitat. It would be a buffer, a privacy buffer, a noise buffer, and it would provide food. What would you, what, like, what would some of the options be? For I would do grapes. And passion fruit. And how long yeah. would it take for the coverage to, to really take hold? Um, if you plant it every 20 feet or so, you're looking at two to three years and you've got a complete food fence. No shit. Covered. Yeah. Because if we lost, we had trees that lined our entire property and probably along that front fence, we lost 50 to 60 trees. Wow. You can see them coming up right now. Sorry for those of you who, even if you're watching a video, you're not going to be able to see this, but you see the little, they're about a foot, two feet high. 
So they're actually coming back. We're going to replant them, but now they're coming back and it's going to take a long time for those yeah. to really come back. Mm -hmm. So to have some sort of coverage there that would be a food forest as well would be friggin' amazing. And now, do you like berries? Yeah. Oh my God. I eat a shit ton of berries. So I, so I would stack that area. I'd take four foot along that fence at least and you could stack it. You could have your roots and tubers. You could have sweet potatoes and potatoes in the front, which they're an annual, but they're, you literally plant them. You can forget it. And, and like one thing I just saw online on a great YouTube video, a guy planted about 31 pounds of potatoes. Nine months later, 10 months later, got 320 pounds out. Whoa. That's the ROI of nature. Dude. Like, are you kidding me? Oh, and tell, I, I want you to share about the, what the, instead of pruning these fruit oh, trees, gosh. this is brilliant. That's just one of my favorite stack of functions. So yeah, a lot of people, you can create a food forest and do it right. And you can leave it for 30 years or like the Amazon rainforest, a designed human habitat food forest 5,000 years ago. And what's there now? The Amazon rainforest, right? That so was designed. Yes. The Amazon rainforest was a designed food forest. Oh, I had no yeah. idea. Isn't that crazy? Yes. All right, this just came out about a year ago. Archaeologists have done their laser thing and they've seen all these roads and paths and they see where the communities lived. And once the, you know, and I'm a big fan of people, you know, people can be part of this. In that case, they're not, but they could be and they would thrive. So I, on that area right there, I would stack probably three or four layers starting with the roots and tubers, having some smaller bushes, some bigger bushes, and then a few overstory fruit trees and understory fruit trees. And then I'd have the fence all vined up. Yeah. yeah. I love it. I love it. So share with everybody about the, the fruit trees, how we- Oh gosh. Yeah. I got so excited. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Stacking functions. So pruning is where I was going, where you, um, normally when people prune, because pruning helps the energy go into the fruit. So, okay. yeah. And it also helps open up the trees so the sun and the wind can get to the center of the tree and you'll get more of a yield. But most people just cut and throw, right? And it's create yeah. a pile of branch trash, right? Um, so instead of doing that, go out 10 weeks earlier and take and carve a little bit of a, a rim around the edge of the tree. So about, you know, an eighth of an inch deep until you get to the base of the tree, you get the bark off. Then you put this little gadget on there and you put soil in that and you clamp it on, go back 10 weeks later. And that takes about three minutes per tree, per branch. You go back 10 weeks later, you cut that. So you prune it. And now you've got a brand new fruit tree that's worth 20 or 30 bucks. And it took you three minutes and you times that by a hundred or a thousand branches, that's $10,000, $20,000. Dude. Yeah. And not only is it the dollars, but it's, we have to do this because the food supply chain is in big trouble. Yeah. You were saying that there's a, there's a shortage of, of, I guess, across the board in every industry, but I didn't realize fruit trees. I thought maybe just in Austin or in Texas, because we had the snowstorm, they yeah. probably lost a shit ton of them, but- Everywhere. You're seeing that everywhere. Everywhere, because people are waking up and they're starting to grow food. In fact, I think more people are doing gardens this year, maybe even more than the Victory Gardens of World War II or the Liberty Gardens of World War I. I mean, people are waking up fast right now. Yeah, dude, yeah. and you're on the forefront of it. Yes. What are any concerns about this path? Like, where, where, are, the, where are the headwinds for you? The bottlenecks are going to be in the supply chain. So our answer to that is exactly the story about pruning. We want to turn everybody, not just into a grower to supply their own needs, but also it makes a lot of sense to spend that extra three minutes and make 20 bucks supplying the market. Capitalism, the peaceful, voluntary, inspired exchange of value. Mm. How long have you been at this? 14 oh. years obsessed. That's how, and that's how long ago you started, um, that's, food forest abundance no, or has that been more recent? Very much more recent. In fact, um, a little bit ago, about uh, four years ago, when I came back, I my original idea was a thing called the Permacube, which transitioned into the food house, uh, F-U-U-D house. Um, the Permacube is a very fancy greenhouse that has dehydration, aquaponics, hydroponics, microgreens, um, all these different functions in one greenhouse. And I love the idea of it, but when I learned, and it took me a little while to learn this, that the soil is job one. We first have to work with the soil. It's the lowest hanging fruit. That's when I decided to put those 
fancy, awesome greenhouses on the shelf for a little bit. And they might come back in the picture here in the near future. But for right now, we want to work with the soil. Okay. And then I guess with that in mind, or, you know, kind of talking about the future, what, what does a year from now look like for you? Like, what do you envision 10 years from now? Like what is, what, what is, what's on that goal sheet today? Yeah. That goal sheet is rapid expansion. So our core team's mission, we've grown from three people to 27 people in 40 days. And our core team's mission is to serve the cooperative, our designers and our, our Carissa and Travis and Jonathan and Gosday and all these amazing people. Um, Ian, Dr. Ian Scott is our lead designer. We are about making sure that we support the people who are on the ground who are helping people grow food. Because most of these folks, everybody's good at something, but not good at everything, right? We are like their partners. We will handle a lot of the marketing detail. We'll handle contract detail stuff. We'll handle um, in, in business arrangements, business thoughts, and all the different pieces of the puzzle that the gardener, the person who helps people grow food, might not want anything to do with. And it's incredibly scalable. As you know, from three to third for, to 27 in 40 days, we can have thousands. We can support thousands of co-ops. And thanks to podcasts like this, we get the word out. Then when, when, we, when we inspire somebody to grow food, we then, um, we then take that energy and we bring that to our team. And then we hand that client off to the cooperative owner in their area. You see how that can just scale? Yeah. And then, you know, we, we do it here and then people come by and like, well, how, how did you do this? Like, it was so effing easy. Like, and then it just, it's just, yeah. I can imagine the word of mouth travels fast. Yeah. yeah. So in one year, we'll probably have a couple hundred fran- uh, co-ops. In fact, I said franchises. I actually spent a quarter million dollars getting all prepared with all these different details. 254 pages of rules. Now, I don't believe in rulers or authority at all. I threw that shit in the trash. Damn. Our contract right now is two pages. And it's about the willful and voluntary exchange of value. We are so much value to our cooperatives that they're not going to want to leave us. And if they do, we don't have patents. We don't go after people. We're done. Okay, thanks. I wish you the best because you're doing good. You know, you're helping people grow food. Our only thing is you have to work with integrity. And if you mess with our brand, then we have to part ways. That's our our fallback as well. But I tell you what, this pe- this group of awake people that understand why we're doing this, they're the best people to work with in the world. Yeah, man, it's, it's this, this whole sovereignty piece. And it's, yeah. it's a, you know, when you start hearing about Bill Gates owning the most farmland in the US, it's terrifying. <laughs> it's terrifying when you look at what he's playing with, right? He's playing with depopulation, yeah. the mark of the beast. I mean, what the hell is going on here? Yeah. There's some, <laughs> some, some issues there. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, one of the things I do love about what you're offering is, is it's not one size fits all. Yeah. It's like, if, if, if I want to be a do it yourselfer, you got a plan for that. And yes. if I want to be completely hands off, you got a plan for that and everything in between. And I think that's amazing. Yeah, that's, we want to inspire people to grow food. I've got a lot of people that call me up and say, Jim, I don't have the budget to get a design, but I've got some questions for you. I love that. We will have multiple people on our staff that that's what they do all day long is just help people grow food. And we're creating a social media structure whereby people can exchange ideas. So somebody says, hey, I've got this worm. Okay, take a picture. They send a picture of the leaf that's curled yellow or dead or the worm that's on their plant. They send it to our network and somebody's going to answer them usually within minutes. And then where is your, is it at your own network? Is it on a, one of the social media platforms? Where can people find that? So Food Forest Abundance, our uh, newsletter, our website is foodforestabundance.com. And um, then we also have different social media platforms, Food Forest Abundance on all of them. Yeah. Facebook is pretty popular. Um, and then, uh, we're going to really look into the more sovereign, more free speech platforms as well. Yeah. As those things finally start to pop up and yes. figure it out. Yeah. Is there anything else uh, you want to leave the folks with today? <sighs> well, I want to thank you for your energy, your love, just who you are is just magical and beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I want to thank, um, I mean, Dell, this guy's last name is big tree. Yeah, like, put that in the thing and kind of, that's just amazing. I love this human and um, having breakfast this morning with Mickey and, and David um, and just 
the magic that's happening all around. It's, well, the one thing that's been critically important is the more time I spend meditating and allowing my mind to relax and receiving these inspired ideas, it's a direct correlation with how fast this movement is happening for me. Amen so to that. that's what I would say is allow your mind to silence, be in nature, be at peace and follow your bliss. Thank you. Thanks for the work you're doing and thanks for sharing it with everyone. And thanks for being here today. And I can't wait to see what we do out at our property there and the one here and yeah. some cool shit, man. It's some cool shit. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> you're welcome, man. Beautiful.